Okay, well, welcome everybody. It's really, really wonderful to be able to go ahead with the Documentary Australia Foundation Award. And congratulations to all of you for being selected for the DAF Award for Best Australian Documentary. And thank you to the Sydney Film Festival for making this happen this year in the virtual edition 2020. Um, I just before we kick off, I'd just like to acknowledge that we are meeting on Indigenous lands, the lands were never ceded, and we're all in different places in different parts of the country. I'm here on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and um, thank you for their incredible inspiration and leadership over this weekend that we've just had. And uh, May it continue so that social change does happen. Um, so let's kick off and uh, I'd like to introduce our panel for today. Um, this is just uh, filmmakers of three of the ten films in the DAF Awards and we have with us today Ros Horan, who's the director of um, Rosemary's Way, uh, Isabel, Isabel Papad, the um, director of Morgana, thank you for being with us. Oh, okay, terrific. Co-director, co-director of Morgana. And Taryn Lafar, the producer of Our Way. Um, sorry, Our Law, sorry, Our Law. Really terrific films, very, very different films. Um, it's really an interesting lineup this year. So I'm looking forward to some of the audience responses to the films and some of the Q and A's after the films. And um, it's gonna be weird. I know it's gonna be weird not being in a cinema and you know having this kind of disembodied sort of relationship with your audience. But um, I'm sure you're gonna get a lot of very good feedback from your films. So just, um, just to kick off the discussion, I guess what struck me from watching these three films in particular is in some ways, they're, whilst they're very different stories and very different characters, they all deal in some ways with the issue of power, I think, power and transformation in very different ways. Um, whether they're transforming the, the kind of social context in which people live or a very powerful personal transformation or, or transforming the way law and justice is enacted. So I'd be really interested to hear from each of you about um, maybe starting with that theme perhaps. It may not have been a conscious choice to address that, but if there's um, a response that you have, maybe we can start with you, Ros. Um, on, Tell us a little bit about um, uh, Rosemary and about, I'll talk about that later. the way she goes about shifting and changing and bringing, bringing women together and um, if you think it does shift the power dynamic and if it's empowered her and it seems to have certainly empowered the women that she embraces. Yes. So Rosemary is a, a former Kenyan refugee herself, you know, and she suffered domestic violence, sexual abuse back in Africa. She went through a kind of terrible abusive marriage you know she's had a very very difficult past but she has um found her strength you know she was always her her very essence is she's always says I'm a fighter and I I'm going to walk around with my head high and I'll never let these people know feel as though they've defeated me and she's gone on to become one of the most extraordinary um organizers in the community for Hello. migrant women and from her job from her kind of viewpoint as a community liaison officer with the Parramatta police force she can see that there are so many different groups of migrant women who are totally disempowered in Australia and not accessing the rights that women have in this country you know equal rights and these women many of which they just have never left their home or they never leave home. They've, they've not seen anything of Australian society beyond the local shopping centre or the end of the street. So she is actually on a mission to empower migrant women, you know, to, to connect them. And she does it by putting them in connection, like she's trying to, she's trying to charm them. She's got, the wonderful thing about Rosemary is she's hilarious, you know. So her power is in her ebullient personality you know and she, she would come along to you and she'd say you're coming with me you're just coming with me and we're going on a bus trip for three days 
I don't want to hear any no's. You're just going, you know. And these very meek, vulnerable women who are terrified that nobody will understand them and they won't understand anything. And what will their husband say? She gets them out and she actually puts them in in the homes of um, Australian families. She, she lines up Australian host families. And by, by bringing this cross-cultural contact where they spend three days and feel accepted by, you know, Aussies, as they call them, locally born Aussies, but also get to know each other's cultures, you do see through the film this absolute transformation in the women. You know, it becomes an incredibly empowering thing in, term, in, in the sense that it gives them confidence to step outside and begin to participate, you know, think of getting a job or whatever it is they want to do. So her two, I, I say in my little log line about the film, Rosemary's weapon is anything but orthodox. It's actually in laughter. Through laughter and dancing in joy, she empowers migrant women. Yeah, it's yeah. a beautiful story. It's an incredibly uplifting story. And you, you learn a lot from watching Rosemary um, embrace these women and in, in a very simple way. Um, I think it's a beautiful story. Uh, Isabel, I'd love to... Um, no, a little bit about, uh, it looks like Morgana, um, this has been a long journey, this film, I think, for mm -hmm. you and for Morgana. It's been um, quite a long time, many years in the making. Is that correct? Yeah, I just want to start by acknowledging my co-director, Josie Hess. Um, I didn't direct this film alone. Um, Josie's probably one of the most um, uh, smart brave, strong, talented women I know, and we are a directing team. So I'm here on behalf of Morgana just because of numbers, but I just want to really acknowledge that we did co-direct this film um, and it wouldn't have been possible without her. Um, can you ask me that question again? I just needed to say. Yeah, no, it, it's, I think that this film has been many years in the making and so mm -hmm. it covers quite a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about, um, and also, you know, you see in the film, Morgana go through ups and downs and, you know, having come out of a very difficult relationship and really, mm -hmm. you know, discover and empower herself and then, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's quite a journey. The film really takes you on quite a journey. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about not only Morgana's journey but also your journey as filmmakers in the making of this film? It's, yes, it's been a very intense journey um, even in the making of the film. Um, initially the film was going to be a short film um, and it was something me and Josie were going to make together almost as a calling card short. Um, neither of us had made a documentary before. Uh, I'd come from a background of short stop motion animation <laughs> um, and she'd come from a background of like writing and producing but also making erotica. So <laughs> our um, backgrounds are really different and um, Josie was already working with Morgana um, and they actually got me on board to direct her 50th birthday experience, which was to be suspended in a giant bondage installation in the form of a phoenix. Um, so I met Morgana and I found out two years before she'd been this um, repressed housewife in rural Australia. She'd come from a very conservative um, first generation Slovenian immigrant background. Um, she'd really been raised to be a trophy wife and raised to believe that her entire worth in life was, you know, basically to have children and be a mother. And then I guess as, you know, a lot of women find, you know, as they start to enter middle age, there's this kind of feeling that, you know, then you're, she described it, um, that she was expected to gracefully and quietly disappear. Um, and so it really took this um, very, I guess it was for her, you're talking about transformation, but it was, a kind of a burning down of her identity basically like you know the marriage failed you know her, her roles failed um and then she was in this place where she didn't even know who she was anymore you know with this whole identity that she'd been raised to have as a woman in the world kind of burnt down and, and in that void that identity void she found this thread of sensuality that led her on this whole new journey and that new journey was to start making pornography about her own life basically um so so in our film um, morgana goes through two transformations um she's rebuilt um as this kind of um 
queer alt porn star, you know, in the form of the phoenix in the, in the middle of the film. It's the first big um, transformation where she's suspended in this phoenix form, but in a way that's a second facade, it's, you know, the second face, and then she has to die again and be reborn as a more realistic and complete version of herself where she also is accepting of, you know, all her complexity and, and the vulnerability and some of those negative voices from the past as well. So in our film, she goes through two transformative cycles which are kind of illustrated with some of the miniature work and some of her own work as well which kind of feeds artistically into our film too so yeah yeah it's a complex film it's um it's a complex narrative that really takes you on a journey of you know you you quite you feel her liberation but you also feel her despair I mean it's quite a it's quite an emotional journey I found watching it well, I found her duality very interesting because I think that, you know, she's the dramatic tension in the film is, you know, the uh, traditional expectations of women in the world, particularly women of a certain age, rubbing against the freedom of the individual, like those two things kind of constant and the individual for, you know, self-expression, for even visibility, to have a sexuality, you know, to be able to be vis visibly sexual, you know, at, at different ages, you know, with different types of bodies, you know, like I, I feel like, you know, um, certainly in my generation growing up, you know, I didn't see a lot of examples of very visible women over 50 in the media. I think that is changing now, but, you know, who were allowed to have a visible sexuality, you know, without being made fun of, or, you know, like it, it was always like, you know, there was always these standards for men as like the silver fox or, you know, like, you know, the kind of dignified hot older man, but, you know, I didn't see a lot of that for women. So I feel like those role models weren't there a lot when I was younger, but I am seeing it a lot more now, which is really encouraging. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And Taryn, um, also, I mean, in, in a similar but completely different way, um, in your film, uh, Wendy, she, she's got quite a story, quite a backstory, which you only really find out kind of halfway through the film. I was really intrigued by um, how that police station, it's a story of a, um, is it the only Indigenous run police station in all of Australia or just in Western Australia? Up in all of Australia. In all of Australia. So um, it's fascinating, fascinating. I actually watched it with my daughter who said, I can't believe there's only one um, <laughs> Indigenous-run police station in all of Australia. Um, I guess why aren't there more? But before we go on to that... Um, Indeed. <laughs> her story of how she came to be there and, you know, the you immediately see the different approach towards... Mm you know, law and order you power. Know, in, 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 towards power. Absolutely. A completely different manifestation of power and a kind of sharing of power. You see it straight away. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you found the story and how you found Wendy and a little bit about the genesis of the story and how it came to be? Absolutely. So thank you. Um, so our law um, we made in 2019, I was actually at um, AIDC conference in Melbourne. Um, I'm based in WA and I bumped into a colleague of mine, um, Sam Bodie Field, who's my co-producer on our law. And he just made a documentary on one of the most multicultural police stations in Australia where it was, they had the first, um, it was, where the, a, a woman was allowed to wear the hijab for the first time in that in her role as a police of, police aide or officer, so I bumped into Sam. He said to me, "Hey, have, Taryn, haven't seen you for a while. Have you heard about the um, this Indigenous run police station?" And sort of started to started his next sentence, and I said, "I'm in. I'm in. Let's talk. Uh, this is definitely total, um, up my alley." So really, from there. Um, I started, so basically uh, he, we bumped in, in Melbourne. Before I even left, I started to research and look what was what was happening. Um, and in 2017, in Warakuna, which is three and a half hours west of Uluru, um, the first Indigenous front police station in Australia was uh, opened. Um, and it, it's being run by two Indigenous police officers who are Noongar, so they're from the southwest of WA. 
Um, and they happened to be in Perth for the Reconciliation Action Plan when I got back, when we both got back from Melbourne. So we met those guys, um, Senior Sergeant Revis Ryder and Wendy Kelly, quite early in the piece. And then we, we, um, we went and met with the wonderful um, Miss Daisy Ward, um, who's one of our, um, who's one of the elders in Warakuna and um, worked with her and um, got our permissions through, through that, that powerhouse. Mm, mm. And the, I like the way the reveal of Wendy's life comes halfway through the film. Um, that was an interesting device. And why did you choose to sort of reveal that later? Um, can you tell me a little bit about how the, you know, the structure of the narrative, I guess, came together? Well, I th I, yeah, absolutely. I think that um, really we didn't want that to be of too much of a focal point because it definitely adds to... Um, I think the sense of uh, trust and 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 relatability to um, when it comes to um, police officers are human beings as well. So I think so. Really, I think it was not appropriate to bring it up at first because we were trying to just educate people to the circumstance and that there are these Indigenous police officers. And Wendy was generous, you know, with sharing that part of her story um, and the impetus for her to give up alcohol. Uh, many many moons ago now, um, but really it was about it's about exposing what was happening in Warakuna um, with R Wendy and Revers and with the community, and then um, yeah it was about revealing that these guys are humans too. So it, it it had to it couldn't go anywhere but sort of you know after we got to know them a bit more really. I mean, you know, it's it's incredibly inspiring actually to see this story at this time in particular after mm. weeks and weeks of protest with the Black Lives Matter movement all around the world and with a particular focus on the police and the and the massive disconnect between the police culture and people on the streets. And here is this story, this beautiful story um, about people who are who are trying to understand each other. There's beautiful scenes of them trying to learn the language, learn language, um, Aboriginal people learning language of other Aboriginal tribes, other languages, and just there's a humbleness and, and a gentleness that you don't normally see in police force, you know, anywhere else in the world. No, that's right. I, um, and I think that that was... You know, I think that that's not unusual, you know, as soon as, you, you know, the further out of the city that you get, I think things are a different place and a different pace um, and and the relationships are, are, people are able to engage when, when you're working with a smaller community. So I think that, and Revis and Wendy have invested a lot of time and effort to the way that they do business. But frankly, that's, an a, you know, it's definitely an Indigenous way of doing things because many of us are not working on the country we come from. Cornell Ozies is actually my cousin, and we're both from the Kimberleys. Um, so for us it, as well, like even as filmmakers, we are often working with other Indigenous people, um, and we have to go through the same processes and protocols, and we always tend to, to leave with some language words ourselves. So it's kind of very much how we operate as Aboriginal people and trying to sort of extend and share that approach with mainstream Australia in order that they might support some of these um, initiatives and responses. I mean, the, in this situation, obviously, it's to do with the police, but this, this it's sort of the, 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 some of the issues um, in regards to institutionalised racism and uh, um, it, we're able to sort of start opening the, you know, the timing is great to open up the conversation, but we've been, you know, we've, we've been protesting for a long time. Oh, for course. From the Aboriginal side. For sure. And, and there's no question that we have a lot to learn. We have a lot to learn from from each other. Well, we have a lot to learn from you guys. Um, and we have a lot to learn from other cultures. And, and I think that's one of the one of the great strengths also of Rosemary's Way, that, that um, you learn. I mean, Rosemary brings people, women together from very different cultures, mm. you know, her women are not all from Africa. They're from very different cultures. And there's a wonderful cultural exchange. In fact, Ross, maybe you can speak a little bit to, I mean, I think quite central to the film is the notion of learning from each other's cultures. Yes. Well, you, so when she, so twice, she's been doing this for 13 years, completely 
as her own initiative with no resources or she gets given a bus for free from start to community organization and she gets another migrant resource organization to give her about 500 cash to cover some shopping that they do but essentially once she's lined up the host family somewhere in rural australia they cover the costs of feeding the migrants who stay with them but she tries to get the broadest mix of cultural groups, you know, so that let's say you were hosting Taryn and, and so you, she'd probably put an Afghani in your house with somebody from the Congo. So it's a three-way thing of, you know, neither of them know anything about each other's culture. And, and what was so lovely to discover too, I mean, we all talk about Africa as if it's one place, but when, <laughs> one, of the, when one of the young women introduced herself who, and she was here as a student and she'd come from Ghana, and, you know, she didn't know anything about any of the other African cultures. You know, she was fascinated to meet somebody from Sierra Leone or the Congo and, you know, to just the sharing of what they have as, as common humanity and also common struggles that they have. You know, everybody wants similar things, a, a safe life, you know, a, an education, a job, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's just incredibly validating and enriching. And at this event, they spend three days together and she usually has some Indigenous experience, like one of the ones I filmed, she had some Aboriginal elder women teaching the migrant women to do painting on silk and they all had to paint something about their own culture, which was absolutely gorgeous. You know, and these women never touched a paintbrush or whatever and they were so getting into this craft class and then they all stood up and talked about why they used that colour or that pattern and, and what it meant to them. Uh, at the one in Kayama, she, he, she had Uncle Max and Elder taking them on a bushwalk and, you know, teaching them about bush tucker. And it was fascinating. Actually, one of, the, one of my, the camera person, one of my, you know, white colleagues said she found it incredibly moving to see how these migrants seem to be so much more respectful and interested in Indigenous culture than so many white Australians. You know, they... They were riveted and they were there and they felt by having an Indigenous presence in, in the whole experience, they really felt this was an authentic welcome in, into Australia. Um, but it's just they do things together, they cook together, they, you know, sometimes they do things like yoga or they do each other's nails and it's just that woman-to-woman -woman thing um, of getting to know each other. Like pe people come out beaming. I mean, one of the most moving moments uh, for me in the film is this woman from Bangladesh who had been here when I because I didn't know what I was filming you know what it was going to be exactly I was just following Rosemary but you know I didn't know the, quite the, the hidden depths of this experience and when she arrived and got off the bus in the Blue Mountains and I said to her what's made you come or why are you here she said I've been 20 years in this country and I've never been out without my husband or my son I've never been out alone and I have to I have to learn how to make a friend, you know, how to how to connect with people. And at the end of it, after staying with her host, because she suffers a lot from depression now, she'd been through in a very, you know, she was one of the most fragile women in that particular group. And afterwards, she was quite overcome. She said, you know, they put me on their veranda and they put me on a couch and they bought me a pot of tea like a celebrity. She said, you know, nobody has ever done this for me in my life. And it was just... You know, she's just ne never been treated like, like the kindness of strangers and the kindness of strangers from different cultures, um, you know, opens up your heart, you know, and, and opens up your, your confidence and, and thus it becomes really an empowering thing. Yeah. And what, what have you learned, Rose? What have you learned from Rosemary? I've learned, well, she, she, she does things, um, she does things, in a pretty ad hoc way, you know, it's not like she's a bureaucrat and she's doing, you know, it's probably like how a lot of Indigenous people work very, intu very intuitively. And I've just sort of, I, I've, I've, I've just learned to so much respect that, that process and that she leads with joy, you know, she doesn't, she knows all these people have, have suffered. As, as you say, you put that story in later in your film, you know, it's like Rosemary doesn't go head on towards... Uh, drawing out any of this, you know, any of the kind of backstories or darker things. She just leads through joy and then people connect and then they start to share 
what their, you know, their problems with their children or their problems with their husbands. And one woman says to another, you know, my husband's beating me up. And she says, well, tell Rosemary and she'll refer you to somebody. So I, I've just learned so much to respect that lateral pathway, you know, yeah. in, into empowerment. Yeah. yeah. And, and Isabel, what, what have you learned from both from Morgana and also from the process of making the film? <laughs> um, Gosh, that's a good question. Um, I think that Morgana finding this whole new life and community and identity and form of creative expression, um, you know, at her age with her background, um, a really radical change of life. Um, I've learned really well and truly that it's never too late, <laughs> you know, for a major change in your life. You're never too old, um, mm. you know, and, and I feel like, you know, we're conditioned to think that there's some kind of age limit to finding, you know, your, your path in life or finding your community. Um, I think in terms of making the film, I'd say just perseverance, you know, and it, just the force of the will. <laughs> like it's been an incredibly long journey. We've had very little support financially. Um, you know, it's been um, like six years. We had no funding. Um, you know, we made it. You know, very like we got money through Kickstarter, but um, that was even that in itself has been you know a lot of work. So, um, so just the endurance it takes to make a documentary. Um, you know, we were writing for about three years. You know, editing for about three to four years. Just starting to do cuts ourselves. You know, me and Josie both did full cuts of the documentary. You know, it was really a really difficult edit because it's a one woman show, as anyone who's seen the film knows. And she's not a, a known entity. Um, you know, she's not like Patty Smith or something like that. So you know, the, the and it's a single perspective as well. So the challenge to make that engaging to pick, you know, create. An engaging character that people are going to want to keep watching, um, you know, to unroll the narrative in a way that continues to surprise and move and engage. That was with an unknown subject, you know, um, and a one perspective type of film that was extremely challenging. So I guess um, perseverance. Um, Look, Morgana's um, not unknown to me, so I didn't learn a lot from her. You know, I'm from inside the kink community. Josie's from the porn community. You know, a lot of the stuff that we talk about in the documentary, it's, it's not news to us. You know, we're both artists. We've both had our own issues with mental illness as well. You know, like all, all of the stuff we're covering, um, for me, it wasn't new to me, but it was something I wanted to share. Um, I've learned that men have really gotten a lot from our film too. <laughs> that was um, that sounds um, prejudice of me, but it's something I wasn't expecting. How many men have reached out about it? Um, so, so yeah, I guess you know perseverance, and it's never too late. Yeah, terrific. No, absolutely. And Taryn, if you were to try and encapsulate what you've learned from from Wendy, not only Wendy, from the story in your film and Daisy, and also from the making of the film. Uh, okay. Um, well, I was the uh, I, I, like like Isabel, perseverance and the show. It's not over till it's over. Wendy is a remarkable example of not just survival, but pushing through and forging and reinventing the wheel for yourself. You know, um, her her openness and her influence. It's very much how I kind of operate as well. So it's good to be around other women who share the same values. Um, in respect to working, I've never, I mean, I made a very, very cheeky, very irreverent um, web series um, earlier last year, KGB, and I was surprised to get permission um, by the WA police to even pursue after that after that process because um, I never thought that I would work in this documentary space with police. Um, it seemed a bit out of my sort of context, but... It has, it has shown me that we've got a great opportunity right now and we've got police officers who are prepared to talk and to be open about the circumstances that they, um, that they, the, that, that they have lived and that they work in. Um, so really it's encouraging to be around other, other Aboriginal people who are fighting the good fight, so to speak. Um, uh, what have I learnt? Um, 
Well, I come from a few naughty people and a few lawbreakers. So, you know, not all police are bad. <laughs> I learned that for sure. Um, but really, I think it's really, you know, it's, it, for me, screen has always been a political vehicle. So I'm going to use it to that end um, as an Aboriginal person. Um, we are developing a series. So there's, I've learned that there's much more story. I already knew there was much more story to expose. Um, but what else have I learned? Um, I don't, I, I've been working, you know, with Indigenous people my whole life. Um, so there's not, there's nothing new on that front. No, I mean, hmm. Why, why aren't there more Indigenous-run police stations in the country? Well, that's a good question. Um, I'm very much hoping that this is a bit provocative um, and inspirational, not only to other regions in WA, but that it does have, a, have a, an influence on other states and um, territories around the country, obviously under, each under a different jurisdiction. Um, I mean, I think it's about the bravery and the progressiveness of, of police commissioners. I mean, there is an ugly history and it takes a really remarkable leader to be able to acknowledge that and then to do something about it. So I think that um, the current commissioner, Chris Dawson in WA, has shown, has put his money where his mouth is. You know, there's there's been apologies and this is the action behind it. Now we've seen that it's a, a system, it's a, it's a, a working environment. You know, people feel respected on, uh, you know, the, the community. Um, the relate, it was really, it was really satisfying and re reassuring, not just for, for me in context with my family, but for all Aboriginal peoples, our children and our grandchildren to know that there is a change happening on that, on this side. Um, and I expect that this is going to, um, it is going to rock the boat. And we are going, you know, hopefully we do see a bit more action on this side because um, mm. there was another death in custody in WA on Friday night, so um, five days ago. So the issue is it's not going away um, and the chance is there now to deal with it, to do something. I guess also it's interesting because there needs to be a preparedness to work from within the system, mm. which is probably not for everybody, right? Very much so, very much so. I mean, I was a political, uh, quite an activist in my youth and I was a bit radical and a bit loud and a bit wild and, and you know, occasionally a little angry. And I recognised like 25 years ago, whatever it was, that that approach didn't work, you know, and that really you have to work within, this, you have to infiltrate from within, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So the idea of... And it makes complete sense to me because there is a lot that these police officers deal with in, you know, that we don't uncover in the film that we hope to sort of address as we get into the series development um, to talk about the, the racism that they experience. And you have to have a really big, strong, strong backbone to deal with the, that legacy, you know. Well, it's really, um, it's really changing culture. It's changing the police culture. It's changing it's, the culture of the police force. Absolutely, and I suppose that's the that's the opportunity that all the police commissioners around Australia have, is that with this momentum from Black Lives Matter in America, and then obviously that's that's um, you know we uh, we respond to that because the same there's it's similar yeah, reasoning <laughs> as to why we're in these positions in the first place, um, but I do feel that that it's you know. It would just be such a wasted opportunity for not for this not to be harnessed and shared, and that's part of why I'm a filmmaker is so that we can um, we can reveal some of these great little pockets of stories because otherwise you know people if people don't know they can't engage with it. Mm -hmm. So it's about just ensuring that we keep on getting these stories out there so that people can in the in the power brokering places can change things from their side. I'll do what I can, and yeah. they can do what they what they need to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, Ros. No, I, I just want to say, sort of re reflecting more that really, on I was talking about what I kind of learned from Rosemary and her style, but on a broader level, the film is about something bigger than just Rosemary, and and it is about where the gaps are in our multiculturalism. And I feel I've learned an enormous amount about what we, well, you know, we pride ourselves on this successful multiculturalism and we are in many ways in that we have 
you know, 50% of our population almost are born overseas and we have all these different cultures here, generally not bashing each other up or fighting. Cronulla was, you know, an exception. But we don't mix. You know, we really mm. don't mix. And I learned a hell of a lot that I found very confronting about what siloed existences we have and how many Australians would actually love to meet uh, somebody from Afghanistan or somebody from Africa but don't know how to reach out and find them. It, it works both ways, both sides of the fence. And I was fascinated to discover because I think governments, when people arrive, they think, well, maybe all the people from the Congo want to live in Auburn or something next to everybody else from the Congo. Well, it might be good for a little while because you've got the language and you've got the food and whatever, but they don't feel they're in Australia if they don't get out of that, you know? And so there's an awful lot of um, people, refugees and migrants, living on the fringes of Australian society that just aren't part of the, of the mainstream. And I'm really hoping that when we campaign this film, it will bring communities together. Like Rosemary's Way is one way of doing it, you know, what she's set up, her cultural exchange program. But I hope every community, and we want to get it right around the country, that sees this film will say, okay, what can we do to reach out, you know, and bring in the other? And we all are so incredibly empowered and enriched by this. Mm. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Look, I... I totally agree. I, there's no shortage of incredible stories out there and incredible people really making a difference. Yeah. I, I just want to say we probably have to wrap up, but just um, finally I'd, I'd just like to say that um, it's really of great importance to Documentary Australia Foundation to make these stories and these people visible, you know, especially we're living in a time when the media is saturated by a particular story or a particular theme. Many of your stories mm. go under the radar and unless we really promote these films and really take these characters, these people, these stories, these issues, different ways of doing things to the public um, and to audiences who see themselves reflected by these stories and, and understand the issues that people deal with every day, um, a lot of this is just invisible. In fact, as we've seen with, with you know, many Indigenous stories and incredible Indigenous leaders, um, they're not known and a lot of that history is invisible. And so I really want to thank you all for your work. Um, we're really, really pleased and honoured to be able to support the documentary community in Australia. Um, you know, I'm absolutely thrilled we've been able to go ahead this year and to be able to celebrate and recognise your work as documentary filmmakers. So congratulations to all of you and thank you so much for making your films and um, we'll be promoting the hell out of them. So hopefully there'll be many, many audiences that we can't at this stage shake hands with, but one day in the future you will meet them, I hope. And thank you also to Sydney Film Festival for making this happen. Thank you. So thank you very much. I can't wait to see your films, ladies. Yeah. <laughs> Likewise. Thanks, Mitzi. Thank you. Okay, good luck.